Ephesians, if you would go to Ephesians chapter 6, let me mention by way of interest this morning, we had a couple of different uh, pastors, of course we have retired pastors that uh, go to church here, this morning we got a couple that are not, uh, maybe retarded, no not that, but uh, um, most of you know Alex Beyond, and uh, Alex is going to be leaving town and going to Alabama, and so he is in our service this morning, we appreciate his being with us, and he's labored here for a number of years in the Spanish ministry and reached folks, and we're certainly uh, glad to know him and tr- certainly wish him the best as he moves on to a new ministry there in Alabama. And then I'm not even going to try the name. It just wouldn't stick with me, but is it is Josh or John? Okay, but the last name is what's got me. And so what, it's, see what I mean? Okay. Iten Flesh? Okay, close enough. But he's a pastor in Charlotte. And his family is here with us this morning. They're just here on vacation. And so we appreciate their being here as well. And certainly glad that all of you can be here. And if you find your place in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to have a word of prayer. And then we'll begin. Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity we have to be in this service. Lord, to understand that we need you to speak to our heart through your word. We thank you for these songs that we've heard and our hearts have been prepared. But we need you to meet with us in a special way to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the way you'll work today and give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We, of course, have been looking through the book of Ephesians, and especially as we've come to chapter 5 and chapter 6, we've seen the context of the family. Now, it begins to take on some other thoughts as we go into the end of chapter 6, but we've remained in that context and applied it in that way, and we're going to do that again this morning, because last week we looked at the armor. And we saw that God has provided us a defense against spiritual warfare that takes place in our life. And he's given us all of these uh, different uh, means to defend against the attack of the devil. And of course, we've seen the offensive weapon was the word of God, which is wielded by the Holy Spirit himself. But you'll note that he ends here, and it's certainly not the least important. It really is uh, the, the primary part of all of the armor. In verse 18, he says this, Praying always. Now God has given us this armor, but it finds its basis, it finds its resource right here in prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now though we know that this entire passage goes beyond merely uh, how we might respond to our family, because we've looked at it in that context... And we talked about the attack, and there is an attack on the family. And it's not an attack by our culture, it's an attack by the devil. Now, he uses the culture and other means, but how are we going to see him defeated? Well, he's already been defeated at the cross. But to see that practical victory, it's going to begin in prayer. Prayer is not an afterthought. Prayer is not simply something we do after all else fails. But rather, it says praying always, never neglecting. I understand that the heathen approach to prayer, and it might even be Christianized, but the heathen approach is as simply some type of a spiritual exercise. Like, for instance, the family that prays together stays together. Well, that might be well true because God keeps them together. But it is not just the process of saying a prayer that is anything in itself. Prayer implies dependence upon God. It demonstrates that I cannot do it myself. It demonstrates that I need Him in every aspect, and that's certainly true when it comes to our family. So how do we pray for our family? I want to if I can, and by no means am I going to be exhaustive this morning. And when you look at prayer, it's a tremendous study. There's so many different aspects and truth to it because it's so essential in the life of the believer. But I want to give a couple of practical thoughts today, just using this as a starting point, praying always, how do we pray for our family? Well, there's a couple of things that are introduced here that I think we do well to remember. The first thing I want to note, and it's right here in the book of Ephesians, is the foundation for this kind of prayer. Now, back up for a moment. We looked at this weeks ago, but go to chapter 3. And I want you to notice in chapter 3, is it, it talks about prayer right here as well. And I'm not going to lay the whole premise again for the first three chapters. We spent a good bit of time talking about our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. But as a result of that, in verse 12, in whom we have boldness 
and access with confidence by the faith of Him. The word access. Who do we have access to? We have access to God. We do not come with fear and intrepidation. According to this, we come with boldness. That is to come expecting God to hear. And then it goes on to say in verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask, there's that word for prayer, or think according to the power that worketh in us. Now we're at least introduced to these two truths, that there is a foundation here, and whatever, at least the culmination of that foundation is that I can come to God not wondering if He's going to hear. Not questioning if what's going to, what the request is is going to take place, but I ought to be able to come with boldness, with confidence, and I do it according to the power that worketh in me. Now, the foundation for prayer is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I can't merely come to God and make a request and expect God to answer unless there has been something established. I've got to have a, a relationship with Him. I've got to know Him. You see, uh, someone may well come to God. Let's say they have a difficulty, especially in their family. Maybe they're sitting by a hospital bed and one of their, their spouse or their child or whoever it might be is, is grievously sick and, and they know that God could do something about it and they simply say, God, if you will raise up this person I love and you'll bring them out of the hospital and put them back on their feet and get them well, I'll start going to church. If you'll get them well, I'll tithe. If you'll start getting well, I'll serve you, whatever that might mean. Now, they may at least recognize God could do something for them, but think about for a moment, if you're looking at this from a negotiating standpoint, what do you really have to offer God? Is God helped because you go to church? Does God need your tithe? Does God, is He impressed that you somehow could offer Him a talent that He doesn't have access to? See, it's a misconception that somehow we're paying God back when we do these things, it is a privilege to serve God. But it's understandable why a person who doesn't know God might think that God would operate on that level. See, they're under, misunderstanding the most important part of prayer is the foundation. Hebrews ten nineteen, and whom we have boldness through the blood of Jesus. See, we have boldness according to that verse. Not just to come into God, not just to talk to Him. But it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. An allusion to the holy of holies. That is to go to the most intimate place where God would, would, would reside. A place that no Jew could go. That no human being on this earth could enter except the high priest once a year. But as a believer, spiritually, I can go right into the presence of God. You say, wow, if you can go right into the presence of God... I got some requests I'd like to share with you. I've got some things I want you to tell him. I mean, if you can go right into the presence of God and you can get a hold of God in that way, then let me give you my list and I'll just, uh, just have you pray for all of these things if you can do that. But let me tell you, it is not because I can go into his presence because I'm a preacher or I can go into his presence because I have uh, done certain things for God in my life. If you know the Lord Jesus today, you have what's required to do that and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, if I'm going to have the right kind of foundation, first of all, there's got to be a removal. You know, the Bible says over in Isaiah chapter 59, the uh, Lord makes this point to his people. He says, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. Neither is his ear he heavy that he cannot hear. They're questioning themselves, why won't God answer? We've asked, we've pleaded, we've given sacrifices, we've talked to him, we've asked for deliverance, and there's no deliverance. Isaiah says, God's hand is not short that he cannot save. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. Then why? But your iniquities have separated you between you and your God. Your sin has hid his face from you that he will not hear. You understand, we come into this world as sinners, and God cannot fellowship with evil. Habakkuk 1.13, Thou God are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. Who would I be as a human being, a sinful, wicked person who has lied, cheated, stole thought, dirty thoughts to come and say, okay, now I need God 
It's not that God is paying me back. It's not that God says, I'll show you. No, God can't fellowship with evil. He's holy. I can't just walk into the presence of a holy God on my own. I've got to have something removed. And that what's got to be removed is your sin. You see, you have no basis to come into his presence today because you and I both are sinners. There's an obstacle. That obstacle is my iniquity, my sin. I'm not talking about just sins. It's not that God hears little sinners, but he doesn't hear big sinners. It's not that if you just commit a few, God will listen a little. And if you commit a lot, he shuts you off. One sin's enough to separate me from God. And there's far more consequence than just he won't hear my prayer. For eternity, I'll be separated from him in hell without Jesus. But that sin has to be removed. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So to set this foundation, I recognize, first of all, there's got to be a removal. But you know, there's also got to be a restoration. You know, it's one thing to remove the obstacle, but Jesus did more than that. He made it possible for me to restore what Adam lost for me, and that is my relationship with God. Galatians 3, 13. Looking at Jesus as he's on that cross, as he dies, as the nails are piercing his hands, as the thorn is on his brow, as he cries, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As he says, into thy hand I commit my spirit, and he yields up the ghost. And then three days later, he comes out of the grave, and Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? Being made a curse for us. He took my curse. He took whatever it was that separated me from God, that invited judgment, and now through the Lord Jesus, I've been restored. Now, if I'm going to have a foundation laid, I've got to get my sin removed. Yes, there's got to be a restoration, but do you know there's also got to be a relationship? Now, it'd be great just to know that God took away my sin. That'd be a great thing to know that God just removed it, and if I had a request, I could ask him. It's wonderful to know that he's restored me now. Okay, I know God. I'm going to be in heaven. But it's better than that. He gave me a relationship. Uh, Romans 8, 15. The spirit of bondage to fear. We no longer have that. But now we have the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know, it's one thing to say, God, will you help me? It might even be something else to say, Father, will you do this for me? But to say, Daddy, can you help me? That's what Abba means. Now, if you're going to pray, don't overlook the fact that you've got to have a foundation. You've got to know Jesus. I mean, it'd be great for me to talk about the great things that God could do today, because He does have great power. But you remember it says He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to what? The power that worketh in us. It is not us. It's not just my asking. It's based on a relationship. Now, many of you, most of you probably would give testimony this morning that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, when you have a relationship with him, you probably, perhaps at least at some point in your life, have overlooked just what you have. To enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, to have boldness and access with confidence. I wonder how many times we come to prayer wondering if God will even hear well, if you do, you must be basing it on what he thinks of you. But if you come in prayer based on what he thinks of Jesus, that changes it. That's the foundation. Amen. Now, knowing there's got to be a foundation, I want to show you another principle. I want you to turn to Matthew, a very familiar passage when it comes to prayer, and go to chapter 6. And I want to tell you there's not only a foundation, but it's necessary that you have the right focus. Now, if we're going to pray for our family, there's going to be onslaught. The devil's going to attack. It can be a spiritual attack. It can be a physical attack. I mean, the devil may come from any direction. He tries to uh, break up a spouse and a, and, and, and a marriage. He can try to get direction for your kids and lead them in a different direction. Um, he can try to come up and disrupt you from, from, from places you don't expect. And yet, God says that we can pray and expect him to answer. But I think the thing we've got to remember is to focus. Look, if you would, in Matthew chapter 6. Now, you are familiar with this passage, but I want you to note a couple of things about it. He says in verse 7, When you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do, 
For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. You know, heathen pray. I mean, lost people pray. Prayer is simply asking a deity to do something for you. And they think they will be heard by the amount of prayer that they produce. Vain repetition. I mean, it could be the same phrase or it could be just doing the same thing all the way. I mean, imagine just simply doing something in a rote way over and over and over and thought, well, that much volume, God's bound to be impressed. He says, don't do that. That's how heathen do it. Don't turn it into some kind of a Christian. Well, if I every day mention this request, God has to answer. Well, it's good to continue to pray, but don't become in vain. Repetition's fine, but not vain repetition. But go on. He gives this instruction. Be not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Well, then the question is begged then, well, why do I even need to ask? Because that's the way God set things up. He wants you to ask him. Oh, well, I guess if he doesn't, it'll still take place. No, he wants you to ask. You've got to have the right focus. And who is the focus? Well, the first focus is the father. You see, he doesn't start this prayer with your need. He starts this prayer with the father. Now, this is not a prayer per se that we pray. You can pray it if you like. This is a principle of prayer. Jesus said, let me show you when you pray, do it like this. And how does he start? He says, after this manner, therefore pray ye, verse 9, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He starts the prayer with the Father. He ends the prayer in verse 13, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever." Amen. He starts it with the Father. Hallowed be thy name. He ends it with the Father. Thine be the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You see, the first and foremost focus of the prayer is the Father. How many times do we go to prayer and we're far more focused on our request than we are the one to whom we're requesting? I mean, John 14, 13, Jesus made a tremendous promise. Whatever you shall ask, in my name, that will I do. But don't leave out the last part, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You see, when I pray for the glory of God, I'm on praying ground. I may not even know exactly what it is that God wants to accomplish, but if I come and say, God, yes, I've got a family member that's sick. Yes, I've got a kid who's going to stray. Yes, I've got a problem between me and my spouse. Yes, I've got a financial need that's affecting the well-being of our family. Uh, yes, I've got to make a decision that's going to have long-term implications. And God, I don't know exactly what it is that you can do, but I'll tell you whatever it is, I want first and foremost it to bring glory to God. What could happen that would bring glory to God that wouldn't be a good outcome? I mean, He's first. If we focus, first of all, unto Him, then our prayer is in the right direction. So we start with the Father, but you know there's more to the prayer than that. He also focuses on the future. Look, if you would, down in verse uh, 10. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, wait a minute. I've got a request here, God. I'm trying to get busy. I, I mean, I've got some things that I want to take place. You know what, really, the true prayer wants to take place, Father? I want your will to be done on this earth like it is in heaven. Now think about for a moment, we talked about spiritual warfare. We talked about, I'm not going to go back and rehash that, how the devil uh, works behind the scenes and, and spiritual warfare and so forth. What does that cause on this earth? The will of God not to be accomplished on this earth. Now, this is the world that the devil runs. God allowed him to do it. He's called the God of this age or the God of this world. Now, on this earth... The world system is in control right now. Right now, Jerusalem is trodden down of the Gentiles. I mean, right now, the devil's system is in control. You don't have to look far. Uh, if you uh, carried a Bible to school, to a public school today, you'd probably recognize the devil's in charge of this system. If you try to go uh, give the gospel out in some place where more than a few people hear you in a public arena, you're probably going to find out that the devil runs this system. You try to oppose uh, some kind of the uh, cultural ills that we take today in some kind of a broad way and say, I'm against that. The Bible says this, 
you're going to find out that the devil runs this system. What does prayer do? Prayer is an intervention by God to say, yes, I'm letting the devil run things, but one of my believers, one of my sons, my child just asked me to intervene. Move aside, devil. I'm getting ready to straighten things out. I'm going to make my will done on earth just like it is in heaven for that particular instance that you prayed about. Now, you say, well, what if, you know, what I'm praying about uh, isn't what God wants done on this earth? Then don't bother. What if I don't know if it's his will? Well, that's often the case, isn't it? Don't we pray about some things and say, well, boy, I prayed, and I sure would like for it to take place, and I want it done for the glory of God, but I haven't seen it happen yet. Well, I think we're enlightened on that as we look a little bit further. So think about it for a moment, the future. When you pray, do you have the future in mind? Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. I think about when I pray for my kids, for instance. You're praying for your kids, and it's absolutely legitimate for you to pray that they would do well in school. Why? Well, you think, well, I don't want them to just do well so somebody can pat me on the back and say, you got a smart kid. You might like that too, but you're not praying for that. You're praying for something more long-lasting than that, aren't you? You're praying and say, well, yeah, if they make a good grade in school, then perhaps when they graduate, they can feed themselves. And they won't have to, I won't have to feed them. I mean, perhaps they'll be able to make a decent living. And this, their education is going to be directly related to that. So God, would you help them? And then you may find, well, maybe they're more limited academically. So your prayer is, well, God, would you give them some direction? Because just on this earth, we want them to be able to feed themselves. Well, let me ask you, is it a good testimony if a Christian feeds themselves? If a man wouldn't work, he shouldn't eat, right? I mean, to be able to be a lazy bum and don't have any ability to do anything and be dependent on somebody else, you see, that could be the glory of God, God for Christ's sake and for his honor and glory. Yes, I would benefit from this. I love my child and I want to see him turn out for God, but this is more important. I mean, I might even, of course, when you pray for eternal things, to pray that God would call them to preach or call them to be involved in a ministry or to use their life. Look, if they don't even uh, get called to preach, I hope your daughter doesn't, but if they don't even get called to preach... uh, then they still can be used to impact souls for Jesus. I mean, there's godly laymen that probably have more influence out in the public arena than a lot of preachers do. God just used their life. Certainly, that's praying for eternal things. But even when we pray for just minimal things, I mean, if I, it's okay to pray for your child when they're sick. You've got a reason for that. It's, God's interested in those needs, but the first need is a future need. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You say, well, I guess we just pray. God, we want your glory to be done. And God, whatever your will is, I want it to be implemented here just like it is in heaven. And then we just let God take care of it. So what's the purpose of even praying, one would think? Why bother? Because that's not all. We focus on the Father. We focus on the future. But then we also focus on the familiar. Look at verse 8. Be not therefore like unto them. Here's why. For your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask Him. You know God can straighten out your prayer? Do you really know every time you pray what you really need to pray for? You kind of got an outcome in mind, right? You can't, well, I think if this happened, this would be the best way for this to take place. You may not be right. But you remember our text. I'm not going to turn you back over there, but Ephesians 6, 18 Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. You see, the Spirit of God is involved. He makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. So he says the Father already knows what you have need of before you ask Him. He's already aware of it, but He does want the act of asking. Do you know God's got some things that He would do? He desires to do. It's in his plan in a sense that this is in the parameter of what he's got planned. And it would be a blessing, but you got to ask. You say, well, if he really wants it to be done and we don't ask, God plays by his rules. Does he have the power to sovereignly implement anything he wanted to? I mean, yes. Could he just destroy the earth and start over? Well, I mean, from a standpoint of his ability, yes. But he'll never violate his word. If he told me I have not because I ask not, if he tells me these prayer promises implied in those if I don't follow his guide, there's some blessing that's going to be held back. 
But he says, the Father knows what you have need of. Aren't you glad today that you don't have to go to God and say, I hope I word this thing just right. I know God will listen if I can say, boy, I heard this other fellow, you know, pray over in church, and man, he seems to have such flowery prayers. Now, he may walk with God, or he may just have poetic language. God's not impressed with that. God is impressed with my heart and my relationship with him. So what is the familiar? Well, verse 11, give us daily, give us day, this day our daily bread. You mean to tell me the God of the whole universe is interested in what I eat? I mean, you think that God really, I mean, that's such a small thing, a menial thing uh, to give us our daily bread. Now, I like to get by with a little bit more than just the bread, right? You know, uh, some biscuits are good, but I want some sausage gravy on top of them, right? I think all of us would have to agree he gives us more than merely our daily bread. The point was not, Jesus was simply saying, God's interested that you eat. He's interested in your health. He's interested in your physical well-being. Of course he is. That's familiar. We know that. And, and what is near to us is what we approach and what we see every day. That makes a difference to God. When the devil came and he tested Job, the first time he tested him, God didn't even let him touch his body. He held him back. Then he said, well, if I touch his body, he'll curse you to the face. God said, okay, I'll even allow that. But he was in charge of it. He allowed it to take place. He's interested in our daily activity. It says, forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, that isn't just sinful temptation. That's testing and calamity. God, could you protect us? Do you think God's interested in your daily protection, your daily well-being, and just the familiar areas of life every day that have nothing to do as far as eternity and, and preaching and all of that, just everyday needs that I have. He's very interested in it. I mean, I, I think we can pray about every aspect of our family. Do you pray for your spouse to grow spiritually? You say, well, God wants them to grow spiritually. What do I need to worry about it? Because God answers prayer. If you don't pray for them to grow spiritually, and they're not what you think they ought to be, you're partially to blame. Do you pray for your kids to turn out for God? Not just to get rich and have a good job and be well-known and popular and make you proud. Do you pray that God might get a hold of their heart and that they might turn out for Jesus? If you don't, some of the blame lies on you when they don't. Do you pray for them? I mean, we need to pray. Why? You think the devil's not after your kids? The devil's not after your spouse? The devil's not after your family? And, and, and maybe you're not either any of those. Pray for your parents. Pray for them. I mean, pray for folks that, that you're related to. Obviously, there's more realms of prayer, but I'm talking about the family today. There's plenty to pray for right in your own family. I, I can't imagine you would take this for granted, but you perhaps could, and, and certainly God can, can tell you today not to take it for granted anymore. But what more important prayer would a parent have than to pray for their child to be saved. Oh, well, they're going to grow up in a Christian home. We'll take them to church. Let the preacher tell them. That's great. But you'd better bathe them in prayer. Do you think the devil doesn't want them in hell? But you can pray. God can soften their heart. God can open their heart. He can put the right things in their path and open their heart. Pray. Certainly, we pray for lost family members. God can answer prayer. Man's will is involved. I understand that. Man, eventually a child has to make a decision. But I'll tell you, it's going to be difficult for a child to go to hell over a praying parent. Not impossible, but it's one of those walls that God has put, out, put, put up to keep them out. And by the way, not just a mother's prayer. I don't know why the fathers always get a bad rap and we say a mother's prayer, but we need both, right? We need them both. So we need to pray. So there's a foundation. We've got to know Jesus. There's the focus and then I want to show you lastly, the fountain. Look over to Matthew chapter 7. And we're still in the context of this prayer. Prayer with all supplication in the Spirit. But here's another place where Jesus, right in the same sermon, gave us another principle about prayer. Now, when you go to the uh, chapter 7 and verse 7, you'll notice it says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. 
He that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. What man is there of you, whom if a son asks bread, will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Now, understand that prayer is not a static religious ordinance. It is not just something I go through, or I've got my list, and God has the ability to do it, and if I happen to click one that's just right, God will answer it, and we thank God that he did it, and the other one's just kind of left to the wayside, and you know, just every once in a while, God will do that, throw us a bone, and answer a prayer. That's not at all the case. Prayer is the result of a walk with God. It is the most natural thing that a person could do that knows God is to ask him to do things. And the most natural thing for a father to do for his son is to give him what's best for him. Now, sometimes I ask him for something and I'm glad he didn't answer me. I mean, I've prayed about things and come back later and thought, boy, glad didn't answer that prayer. Who knows? I mean, I, I can tell you, I, I was back in a, uh, in college, and I'm letting you in on this, and I'm sure many of you can relate to it. I'd see a girl walk across campus, and I had a pretty good prayer life at that time. I'd say, Lord, I sure would like to date that girl. Uh, I'm thank God some of them I prayed for, I didn't end up dating. I mean, I, subsequently, I, I, man, I'm glad God didn't answer that prayer. Um, he didn't answer any of them except one, so I uh, thank God he did. But yeah, you could pray for things and say, man, I I thought for sure that's what I wanted to take place. And I prayed and God didn't answer. But it, that one I know about. There's other ones he don't answer that you don't know about. But they're just as much what's best for you. Same answer. Now, think about prayer. Not as a static religious uh, ritual. But as a fountain that's the result of a walk with God. This passage reminds us of this. You know, the first thing I note about this passage very important when you think about the fountain is the person. Now that goes back to our text. You remember when we looked at the spiritual warfare? That we looked at the armor, you put on the whole armor of God and you girt your loins about with truth and the breastplate of righteousness. But then it said the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hey, it is not my sword. I've got access to it, but who wields that sword? The Holy Spirit. Then he goes on to say, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So who is it that is behind my prayer? It's the Holy Spirit. See, the Spirit of God is the person who makes my prayer effective. See, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's the friend of the family. He's the one who leads me in prayer. And again, we said it in uh, Romans 8, 26, the same is true. The, Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we ought to pray for. And yet the Spirit itself maketh intercession with groanings, which cannot be uttered. I wouldn't even know how to pray, but He does. He prays for me. Uh, Jude 20, building up yourself in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Do you know something as important as prayer? God isn't going to leave it just to you. I mean, something as significant as prayer and what God can do through it, don't think that just in your own brain and ability that God says, okay, as a human being in the flesh, you can just ask me something and I'll do it. There's a spiritual work behind it. The Holy Spirit is the person of the prayer. But then I noticed something else in this passage. and You're familiar with this, but read it again in verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now, there's a progression there. What if you had written this passage, or just a man had written this passage, and he was trying to illustrate prayer? Would he have written it in that order? I would make the case that he would have written it in the opposite order. In other words, this starts with ask, and ends with, with knocking. I see it the other way. I see a person coming up to the whatever I'm knocking on, the door, wherever God's behind, and I come up and I knock. Well, I can't get the door open. So what do I start doing? I got to find some other way. I'm seeking. There's got to be some other way to get done what I want done. And then finally, when I can't do it as a last resort, 
I'll ask. That's the opposite of the way God works. With God, you ask first. Okay, now the asking, that simply begins with God. 1 John chapter 5, chapter 5 and verse 14, this is the confidence. Get that word now, confidence. A lot of us pray we don't have much confidence. He said, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he heareth us. Now that's great, but I pray I don't know his will, but listen to verse 15. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, then we know we have the petition we desired of him. You know, God not only wants us to pray and see answers to prayer, evidently he's willing to let us know ahead of time sometimes that I'm going to answer. I mean, that, he, he says if we know that it's God's will, then you actually can, before it even takes place, praise God, I'm just waiting to see how God's going to do it. Now, the majority of things that you pray for that we know to be the will of God are simply just, they're already spelled out in the Bible. You think God's interested in providing your needs? Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your needs. Now, there's a context to that verse, and it talks about a certain group of people that God was willing to provide it for. But if I line up with that and pray, thank God, I'm just waiting to see how he does it. That's the ask. We ask, and then we seek. So again, man's order is totally backwards. First of all, I ask, then I seek. I go to God, I make my request. What is the seeking? John 15, 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. You know, that wasn't wasted words. If you abide in me, Jesus said, that's dependence. And I abide in you. My words abide in you. That's understanding God's promise. You get those two things together, you ask what you will. Why can I ask what I will? Because now my will has lined up with his will. Now I guarantee you I've asked things for God. We kind of jokingly talked about that earlier, asking something glad he didn't give it to me. It's not wrong to ask your father for things that you want. But you've got to be open to the fact to realize God knows what's best. But then, God, I would really like to pray in faith. I'd like to really pray and expect you to work and know that I'm praying. That's when you seek. That's when you, God, I'm already abiding. I'm trusting you. But now I'm going to let your word abide in me. If your word abides in me, well, then I might find out what your will is. You know what happens? You start praying for something. Many things I've prayed for in my life and Many of them are very personal, and you'd have the same type of prayer. Maybe just something menial. Maybe even I even realize now, perhaps even selfish. But he's my father. I ask him things. I pray about anything. I mean, you ought to. You ought to have that kind of ability. Just pray about anything. But a lot of things I've prayed about, I quit praying about and forgot about them. You know why? God wasn't in them. I did just, God never burdened me about it. I was excited about it, maybe for a time or two. But I realized I've even had things I've prayed about and it hit me a year or two later. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't prayed about that in a long time. And it's clear to me now God wasn't in that. That was not part of that. It wasn't wrong to pray it. But the Holy Ghost didn't keep it on my heart. I mean, God's behind this thing. You seek Him and His Spirit keeps that burden on your heart. Listen, if you're greatly burdened about a request you bring before God, take heart. God's probably in it. Now you just get your will lined up with his will. You seek. And then the last thing you do is knock. You know, Proverbs 13, 4 says, The soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Some of you guys are real diligent. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. But the soul of the sluggard desires and has nothing. Now the sluggard, he wants it. But he didn't do anything about it. He doesn't get it. But the diligent, God says he rewards. Now, it's certainly true. You know, people have often said, God helps those who help themselves. There is a biblical principle there. People often misunderstand what that means. Basically, they put the knock first, and they go, I'm going to go help myself, and then ask God to bless what I'm doing. No. But if you take the principle to mean, God is not going to do for you and encourage laziness, he'll open the door you got to walk through it. That's where the knock comes in. There is an aspect of prayer where God says, I am going to pave the way. I'm going to make it available. 
Are there things that absolutely humanly I cannot do? Most definitely. Don't try to do them. Let God do them. But there are things that God would be encouraging laziness in his children if he said, I'm going to do that for you. And so God leaves the knock, but he leaves it last. Now, as we think about this, and I'm going to close with this thought. As you think about it, and you think, boy, that seems a little bit complicated. There's so many principles there. Here's the, here's, the sim, here's the simple part that you can take with you. He says in verse 11, If ye then, being evil, know how to good gifts unto your children. We've been talking about the family. Um, he says, how much more? Not just how much the same way. How much more shall the heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? He didn't say things, but he said good things. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. You may not grasp every principle in prayer. God can continue to teach you, and this is by no means exhaustive. But I'll tell you what you can do. In Jesus' name, because you're his son, God, I want you to do something for me. I'm asking you to give me an egg. And God says, well, you didn't get that prayer worded just right, so I'll just give you a scorpion. Would God do that? That's the question Jesus is saying. It's an obvious answer. Of course, a human father wouldn't even do that. How much more would the heavenly father respond to your ignorance if your ignorance is legitimate? He can teach you some things, but I'll tell you what you need to do is just pray. Just pray and ask God to work. There was a good friend of mine. It's a true story. And it's really remarkable. Um, he's much older now. In fact, he's passed away now. But he shared this story with me. And I knew him well enough to knew, know this story was true. And it was really one of many. But he says when he's early, his early ministry, he had a bunch of kids. And um, they lived on a church, a church property, lived in a parsonage, didn't make much money. He was trying to build this church. And he came in one day and his wife was crying. He said, what's wrong? It was 4.30, quarter to five, something like that in the afternoon. She says, we don't have any food. I was going to try to get supper together. I was trying to just pull whatever I had, but literally I have nothing to, to cook. And I'm frustrated. I don't know what to do. I know you work hard. And I mean, but I, you know, they didn't have any money to go buy anything. It wasn't just a convenience thing. They didn't get paid till a day or two. Well, of course, it struck him as well. But he explains it. He says, God just kind of burdened me. He says, well, have the kids at five o'clock or whatever supper time is. Go ahead and have them seated at the table. He asked his wife, he said, don't you think that we are in, in God's will here at this church? I mean, we're serving God. We're not perfect, but we're trying to do right. And of course, she's still crying or whatever. But he's, yeah, have the kids sitting at the table. He got to the front of the table and prayed for the food. God, we don't know where it's coming from. But you promised to take care of us. A lost neighbor, not a Christian, an unsaved neighbor they had barely knew. Of course, he knew he had a bunch of kids, but it's just random. I mean, it wasn't like they did this. They'd never done it before. The neighbor came over, knocked on the door, and Kittrell, uh, Pastor Kittrell, he opened the door, and he said, uh, my wife cooked this huge pot of stew. There's only three of us. I don't know what she was thinking about. We just thought we were talking. I know you got a big family. We, could y'all use this? And all he said to the man was, yeah, yeah, we could. We sure appreciate it. He took it in and put it on the table. Now, how many are you surprised that God can do that? None of us. But how many think it's remarkable when he does? God knows how to meet the need. We just got to learn how to ask him. Let's have a word of prayer.